Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another How to Succeed podcast. I'm your host, Mike Montague, Director of Community Engagement at Sandler Worldwide. And my guest this week is Jason Stevens. He's a Sandler trainer in Boise, Idaho. And we're going to talk with him about how to succeed at motivating prospects. Most uh, decisions uh, and buying cycles end in no decision, actually. Uh, You don't actually win or lose more then you end up in no decision. We're going to talk about how to get prospects moving here. The following podcast is copyrighted by Sandler Systems LLC and protected by U.S. copyright laws. Sandler is the worldwide leader in sales management and customer service training. Find more information at Sandler.com. All right, Jason, welcome to the podcast. Tell me a little bit about how to succeed at motivating your prospects and what are we talking about today? Sure, Mike. First off, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. One of the things that we're talking about when we talk about motivating prospects is how do we really get um, enough tension in the relationship so that there's motivation to make a choice or a decision? And I think that comes from informing someone. And really, the core concepts we're going to be talking about today is problem motivation. So all of us, when it comes to conversations, really, we're motivated by big questions, right? I mean, think about politicians. What are they trying to motivate you with? Are, are they going into the minutia of things? Uh, sometimes, but no, usually they're called <laughs> action on uh, on value judgments and, and big questions. Yeah. Yeah. So they look at those big questions and then br- separate them between practical and conceptual. And so for us, when we're trying to motivate prospects, what we need to do is understand that big questions motivate people. But when moving a prospect, we need them to get clear about the the questions that we're trying to get clarity on and whether it's conditional or situational, and then ultimately try and drive them towards a decision that's motivated out of their understanding of a problem. Yeah, I think there's some interesting thoughts here when we talk about attitude and maybe some common myths and misconceptions around here is that maybe salespeople can convince anybody to do anything. You know, David Sandler said people buy for their reasons, not yours. And you kind of uh, can't sell anybody anything until they decide that they they want it. So do you have any uh, other thoughts about our attitude and how we frame ourselves to get ready for these conversations? Yeah, I think when we go into a conversation with prospects, we should be very clear that about what we're trying to offer them. And that can only come out of the conversation based on the questions that we're asking about what they're facing. So if you're in the service industry, us at Sandler, we're selling a service. So a lot of the problems that we need to get clarity on are really conceptual. And it revolves around like, what are the attitude issues that people are facing? And so when it comes to the attitude mindset that we bring into the conversation, it has to be based on curiosity. Ultimately, we need to understand what drives them because we can't drive anyone to do something that's outside of what their like motivation is. No one acts be, by pressure alone. Yeah. Like if you think about the pain funnel, which is a series of questions that we use in Sandler going downwards. When we put someone in the top in the pain funnel by the question of what's the biggest problem you're having with X, that funnel cycles outwards. And every time someone tries to pop out, our attitude should be, oh, we need to get you back into the funnel to figure out if this is a real issue. Yeah, I like that. Those two things, clarity and curiosity, I I think are two great attitudes to have. I think we want to get really clear about what their picture is. That's another saying the rule, right? We want to find exactly what they're experiencing, what their problem is, what their vision of the solution is. And you also said to be clear about what we're offering, the problems Mm -hmm. that we can help and, and what ballpark we're in so that they can then direct that conversation and be relevant. So I I think relevance is a big one. The more it makes sense to them and what's in it for them personally and things line up, the the faster deals have uh, to, to go through the pipeline and curiosity also the same way. I think, Sometimes the buyer doesn't even know what their problem is or at least what your solution is to that problem. So curiosity on both sides, but especially on the part of the salesperson, I think is a huge thing. Anything you had to add there? Yeah. The final thing about attitude, which I will say in any conversation regarding Sandler is you have to trust the system. Your attitude should be that Sandler works because Sandler does work if you're committed to it. The whole process of Sandler is about knowing exactly what you're going to do. So in a conversation, you don't have to think about it. 
you're instead focused on the other person that you're engaging with. There's no, oh, am I doing this wrong? Oh, should I change what I'm doing right now? Instead, it's complete trust and faith that you've mastered something because mastery is a core piece of attitude that leads to success. I love that. Great attitude to have too. Yeah, I think there's a new Sandler rule here. Uh, sales is a conversation between adults to uncover the truth. That's our, our new number one rule in the How to Sell to the Modern Buyer book. And I love that for what you're talking about there, that if we just think of this as a neutral conversation, we're going to trust that our system and our methodology works and we're going to go through this process and some will be motivated and some won't. It's not our job to change which one they're going to camp they're going to be in. It's our job to work the system and sort these people instead of trying to, to sell them and convince them. Great attitude there. And that takes us to behavior. How do we do the right thing at the right time? What do these conversations look and sound like? Well, think think about whether the problem's conceptual or technical. And that goes back to understanding what you're selling. Because if you're selling something conceptual, then a lot of the conversations you're going to be running into are going to be motivated by behaviors that are asking about very heady things, things that aren't grounded like, oh, is your faucet linking is a very technical problem. We can get to the bottom of that really quickly. But if a sales manager is dealing with a team and badgering them over tallies in comparison to their quota and not attacking the leading indicators that are the reason why their quotas are, they're missing their quotas, then that's a conceptual issue. The danger for salespeople, and this is why we have to be very clear with our behavior about knowing what our product is, is if you get trapped in a conversation where you're going every which and way trying to figure out what's the biggest motivator to your prospect, you're not clearly using that funnel. So maybe when we talk about behavior, I would say the behavior we need to get really good at is memorization and, and use yeah. of the pain funnel. Because if you go down those series of questions, that's a tried and true method to get someone from the surface level issue that they're dealing with to the underlying motivation and whether they're willing to change or not. And you said earlier, some people will and some people won't buy, but really we, we want them to end the conversation with a decision, yes or no. Yeah. And think it overs are, are better than fine as long as we know what their mindset is. So, and by that, I mean, I, none of us want to get a think it over, but when you get one, if you have clarity about what their mindset is, because you ask good questions, that's okay. If they're thinking over is, I have these three steps to do, then you can end the conversation with a clear action outcome. Yeah, really good stuff to unpack there. I want to start with the first one, the conceptual versus technical, because I found this to be uh, a problem for a lot of salespeople is mm -hmm. you need to know what you're selling and why people actually buy it. I don't think yeah. most people know why. They know the features and benefits. They know what the marketing team came up with. They know what the owner of the company thinks is important. But your buyers often buy emotionally, not intellectually, yeah. what you justified. And um, one thing I think about too a lot is a need versus a want. Sandler yeah. is also in this category where a lot of people need sales training not a lot of people want sales training. And so when we're looking for prospects, a lot of times they'll say, well, I'm good at sales. Why would I need training? Or they would say, I know somebody who's bad at sales. You should train them. Yeah. And neither of those make very good prospects for us. We need somebody who's open-minded, who wants to get better and has at least the capacity and an intellectual curiosity to try to get better. And so um, I think when you understand that and you understand whether it's conceptual or technical or where most of your buyers are when they come to you, then you can start asking really great questions. Like, yes. are you aware that you have a problem? Are you aware that there are solutions out there? Do you know the root cause of the problem? And are you emotionally aware enough, like you said, at the bottom of the pain funnel to know what this is costing you in stress and time and worry and ROI. And sometimes there's business validations and there's a lot of questions here that can create motivation. But unless we have a plan for this and unless we memorize those questions, we have nothing to work off of. We're just guessing. Right. Yeah. And if, if you take that model of the old sales style that you're talking about, the person who comes in and is storytelling, it really is storytelling. And so the thing I would push against that we're doing with a, clear methodology to get success is we are calculating 
the best chance of return by instead of telling a story, using tension to have the people in front of us tell their story and get themselves yeah. into a narrative that ends with a solution. Because so often sales, traditional sales models include so much more ego. And in the Sandler model, we're di- di- moving away from that ego and instead focusing on the person in front of us. No, not a lot of salespeople have listened themselves out of a sale. <laughs> right. <laughs> there is a, uh, there's a lot to unpack there. And I guess uh, before we, we I, it'll take us over to technique. Sure. So we can move there and talk about what questions we ask and how we do this pain funnel. Because I think yeah. when you said memorize the pain funnel, I got a little nervous because, you know, we don't do scripts and things here at Sandler, but we do have some frameworks for these questions. And I do think when you're learning how to do this, you do have to memorize those questions first to build off of, and then you improvise around it. And you might take two or three questions to get an answer to that one. Or like you said, they might jump out of the funnel and then you got to bring them back in, or you might have to restart the funnel with a different problem if it didn't work out the way you intended. So can you talk a little bit about the pain funnel technique and any others that come to mind and, and how we use them correctly? Yeah. First I'll I'll just give you a little pushback on the idea of memorizing because I think memorization is something that will save you time and money because you're not thinking when someone else is talking. And so mm-hmm. with rote memorization, yeah, it's a pain funnel and yeah, it's scripted questions, but they don't see them coming because they're in a conversation. And while they may not be questions that you wrote, you're saying them and that ownership translates into the tone and presence that you have in a conversation. So as long as you're authentic and your main purpose in a conversation is to help someone, no one's going to be suspicious of scripted questions. And like you said, from knowing those questions, you learn why those questions work. So when it comes to figuring out your technique, it starts from very basic behaviors. We don't want to pixie dust Sandler into our sales process. We want to try the pieces of Sandler that are set out to work and then mo- like massage our language into them so that we feel that familiarity and learn, right? Because it is a process of learning. Uh, great. So where would you recommend people start or at least start in this conversation? So we're talking about how to motivate prospects. So uh, what may be opening questions or, or techniques do we need to keep in, in mind? And then how do we keep them motivated maybe throughout the, the sales Yeah. Process? Pre, pre-sales calls, what I would suggest people get very clear on doing is a pre-call planning um, and behavior-based KPIs on what you do in a conversation. So If you don't pre-call plan now, you're missing out on the opportunity to be strategic about the execution that you're going to through. And when we're talking about being clear on the questions you're asking, we're talking about strategy and strategy is built out of the techniques of out of this technique. So do your pre-call planning. And then what I would suggest my clients do is they set up behavior based KPIs for what they want to practice in a meeting. We always tell people in training when we're doing role plays, you don't want to practice in front of your clients, but you get better by trying. And so if you're not setting up KPIs to grow, then you're not measuring how much growth you're going through. And so while there are questions that we can go through, ultimately, what we want to do is get better at pre-call planning and then KPIs related to the behaviors to get to motivate buyers, because those two things outside of the conversation will lead to success within the conversation. If you're more strategic about your tracking, then you're going to get better results. I really like that because you reminded me of kind of our referrals behavior that Mm -hmm. the, um, the, what's more important is that you ask the questions, right? Not what their answer is. And I think that's really hard for salespeople, especially when it comes down to the one I, I see people get stuck on is how does that make you feel or asking how oh, the sure. person is doing emotionally and just not asking that question is dangerous. You don't get to the truth, but I think people get nervous and scared to ask that. So I like that idea of just tracking whether I asked how that person was doing or not on a call is a, a huge thing. And if you just ask that question, sometimes you'll get more information than you planned and it'll go really well for you. Yeah, and the subtext to your point is if there's a piece of Sandler that you have underdeveloped, make a KPI around developing that. Because if it's asking people how they feel, that's an important area for you to grow. And if you're not growing with Sandler, 
I think that you're missing the main point of what Sandler's offering you, which is a brand new way of engaging your life and getting better results. So this takes me to the natural next steps of how do we know when we have found a, a, a you know, qualifying motivation, uh, somebody is motivated, how do we do that? And then how do we keep them there long enough to close the sale or, or keep uh, this fresh in their, their mind so that they keep moving with the process? Yeah, honestly, I think one of the biggest underutilized early discussion um, techniques is the thermometer close which is giving someone as a one to 10 on a scale of one to 10. How do you, how do you feel about this? Where one is an X and 10 is a Y. And the nice part about a thermometer close is you choose what one or 10 is. And so if someone is really seems like they're in pain, you can communicate that to them back as a 10. And then from there, it's just closing the gap. So, you know, if they say I'm a seven, we need to ask, well, what would it take to take you from a seven to a 10 or, that seems pretty high. I thought you might be a six. What am I missing here? And I think that's the first stage because once you get someone at a 10, we can then ask the question, okay, during this conversation, I feel like I understand what you're going through. Insert summary here. Based on my summary, I think that we can help you um, with moving forward. What does the next step look like? Because to me, this is what my scheduled actions are that lead to success for clients who have been in similar situations as you. So I think you can do the thermometer close and then transition into a 30 third party story of people like you experience success with X. Are you comfortable talking about what moving forward with X looks like? Mm. I like that a lot. And then the longer question, I, I think we should talk a little bit about motivation over time. I feel like time kind of can kill all deals. Yeah. Uh, and the, we have the pendulum theory here at Sandler where, you know, the kind of the more excited people are, the more likely they'll be to make a decision without you go with a competitor or mm. lose that motivation. And sometimes the other difficult one is the ones who don't seem motivated. What do we do with these kind of two buckets? So I, I would say it depends on the industry. Like if you're an industry that's full of bidding, then you have to make the decision. Are you going to ask your prospects for the final look or the final presentation slot? Or how do you get around the bidding? Do you just upfront say, I'm not going to charge you for the bids that I've given out for free. I'm going to, we're going to make an agreement here. Um, I would say in most industries, an easy approach is to, if someone's motivated, move their motivation into a clear next step. If someone seems disengaged, then I would challenge that disengagement and really push back. I think that it's fair to communicate with someone on a human to human level about the miss, about you not understanding where they are. I yeah. don't think anyone's ever been really upset that a salesperson said, I don't know if this is the right fit for you. It seems like you're not super interested in taking this direction now. What should my next step be? Should I reach out to you in five days? Should I forget? Should I lose your contact information? What's the best way for you to feel like I've tried to help you? Yeah, I like two moves here when they're sure. not interested is... Uh, are, do you think you'd be interested at some time? Is this a hard no forever? Or mm -hmm. should I add you to the email marketing list, you know, catch up with you and and see if it ever becomes a, a higher priority for you at some point in the future or take you off the list? And then um, I like what um, going back to our referrals as well. Um, yeah. So just saying, hey, sounds like this isn't a right fit for you because of X, Y, Z that you shared with me. Do you know anybody else who's in a different situation or uh, what would make this a different situation for you and have those discussions to know whether you should follow up or if there's somebody else that you should talk to in their organization or in their network that would be in a different uh, and better situation than than they are. Yeah, and to reinforce your attitude about both of those, all of us live in the stereotype of there are salespeople in the world and there are buyers in the world. And so when you close out a meeting, even if you're going to say something uncomfortable to someone, remember what you do when you break the stereotype of a salesperson is you lower their defensive walls and allow for genuine human contact and interaction to happen. So asking for a referral is a great way to transition it into a relationship, 
right? You give them permission to step away and also ask them to, you know, if they know people who you can help, your desire is to help people. You're not running around trying to like back arm people into making decisions against their will. Yeah. Any other final thoughts here? I want to get to know you a little bit better and ask some uh, other questions off the topic, but any other concluding thoughts on how to succeed at motivating prospects? I think overall, one of the big things that I wanted to convey that I haven't really touched on would be when you are in sales conversations, try to a con control conversation over spread. And for me, this what this means as a term is in any given conversation, people are tangenting one way or another. And if you don't control the tangents through reverses and questions in response to what they're saying, you'll lose 30 minutes and then maybe your sales call has to drag on and maybe your whole schedule for a day is then wrecked because of it. If you want to control your calendar, control what you talk about in a conversation with the prospect. Back to the point that they expect us to be stereotypical salespeople. We can focus the clock. We'll yeah. break the norm. We won't let them talk about everything. We'll ask specific and calculated questions to get clarity. <laughs> I love that. And obviously what came to mind for me was, uh, and for God's sakes, don't do it yourself. Don't create <laughs> your own tangent and talk about things they don't care about for 30 yeah. minutes and, uh, you know, uh, come up with a whole bunch of features that they're not ever going to buy because uh, that's just going to waste both of your times. Uh, so great lesson to end on. I appreciate it there. We're talking with Jason uh, Stevens, sailor trainer from Boise, Idaho. And um, how do you in your at this point in your career define success for yourself? Success for me is really hitting the behaviors that I think will lead me to my future self in the present. And when I think about my future self, mostly I see the behaviors, but in the present, then the thing that I really need to drive toward on top of those, that behavior, hitting those behaviors is having an adaptive mind that is readily engaging the world and not making black and white judgments about what's going on around me. So I think success is the mindset that I'm open and I see the nuance around me and I understand the importance of doing things that I want and I will do them. And what about the opposite? Was there a failure you're most proud of or a particularly hard lesson learned uh, as it relates to, to sales and being successful with Sandler? Yeah, I think early on when I was using Sandler, because I don't talk a lot, I naturally ask questions. So I thought I was doing it well, but I realized, and um, I don't know if it's through an exact conversation or at least I don't know. It was with someone I was trying to manage and help them grow into sales. I realized that the questions I was asking them were more it came to a point where in the conversation they said this feels like an interrogation can we stop and i was thinking like oh i'm a great manager <laughs> and then i realized <laughs> yeah. sandler can be a weapon so don't yeah. weaponize it if you're curious into a conversation then you won't weaponize it naturally because you're just trying to get clarity Great lesson there for everybody really is in, in uncovering their motivation is, is the question you're asking in their best interest or in your best interest? Um, and it's maybe okay to do a little bit of both, but most of them, you want to be in their best interest uh, and help them make a decision, help them move forward and, and clarify what they're asking for. Last one, do you have a favorite Sandler rule concept quote? Uh, anything that you've learned along the way? Yeah, just based on my biography and my love of cycling, I'm going to go original with the book, You Can't Teach a Kid to Ride a Bike at a Seminar. I think that there's a lot to unpack in that quote, which is just, you don't learn by not doing, you learn by doing. So taking action, reg so taking action is always great, but purposeful action, you go to a seminar, seminar to take something away. Purposeful action in execution always re resolves into learning that will change your life. Whether that's positive or negative, it doesn't matter because I think learning no matter what is good. Yeah. And uh, applying that learning is is crucial. It, it's really, a, I think, all lost if you stick in that theoretical 
range yeah. and, and you become one of those like entrepreneurs that you're reading all the self-help books and you're dreaming about all the businesses you could start, but you yeah. never do any of them. Uh, or you take all the sales training, but never make the call. Um, that isn't helpful. So I, I love what you shared here today. And I'm really glad to have you on the podcast. Any other final thoughts before we wrap up? Well, I'll just end with another reminder. If you're doing Sandler, if you're studying Sandler, your attitude should be, I believe in Sandler because Sandler works, but it's contingent on you to take action. If you're using losses as an excuse to prove Sandler's not working, you're missing the point, which is any system works as long as you believe fully in the system and execute it to the degree that you think will lead to success. I love it. Jason Stevens, Sandler trainer from Boise, Idaho. And we've been talking about how to succeed at motivating prospects. If you found this episode interesting, you can subscribe to it. Uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. We do these live. The podcast feed is on anywhere you listen to podcasts. Check those out and uh, subscribe for future episodes. And like and share this with somebody that you think needs to hear it. When you listen live, you can join in uh, in the comments here uh, as well. So we appreciate that. And... Until next time, whatever you are, be a good one. That's what I always say. Uh, for more information on Sandler, visit Sandler.com. Later, gang.